Sure. Just in time lecture preparation. So thank you. Uh, I've had all of you last, I think, all, all of you last summer, right? No. Not all of us. I was in your class. No, no. Okay. So there's some repeat from last summer. There's some repeat for the two of you who are currently in my concentration studies. There's some repeat. And you saw some of this last year. So I think it's okay if I'm confused about who you guys are, but this is helping a little bit. So some overlap, some not so much. So you'll notice that there are eight topics, which is too many. Um, I'm wondering, I don't see a clock, and I don't have my phone. And, um, Do you have my watch? Oh, well, I have a watch, but I kind of need um, a beep every five, every ten minutes. Okay. Or I can just tell you. Yeah. Ten minutes. That would be great. Or if you can just, you know, you know, it's hard to interrupt, so if you just tap. Yeah. It, it, it'll just occur in the background. Okay. And I'll make eye contact. Acknowledging that I heard your tap. Every 10 minutes. Yeah. Sounds that way you don't have to be shy. You can just click. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you for inviting me. This is, uh, in a way, this talk is an outline of how uh, I want Jennifer and, and me to uh, teach the course, the next version of the History Theory 2 course in the summer. So I'm pitching this to Jennifer, and you get to watch. So this is a quick outline of eight topics. It really covers what I realize I should call colonial modernism in Asia, because uh, it is about modernism, about modern architecture, and it's about colonial forces, some from unexpected sources, uh, because we think of colonialism as being a European thing. Um, but it turns out not always. Um, and it's in Asia, but it is a global topic. Um, and that'll be clear right away. Um, so before Europe engaged with Asia, uh, there was a very dynamic global trade occurring. And the, the trade that we probably understand best is the trade in spices coming throughout these networks uh, of the Silk Road and the Silk Routes, and which there was more than one Silk Road. There were multiple Silk Routes, some of them by land. But then when the Mongolian thing happened in the 13th century, there was a, a widespread disruption and then a restoration of trade routes because the Mongolians were actually quite effective at safeguarding the trade routes. So um, it, it shifted over the course of several centuries. Uh, but before, long before Europe knew anything about this map and this territory, uh, Venice was the port of entry for Europe of all the extremely valuable spices. And when you go to Venice, uh, you should see more than just the center of European culture. You should see a gateway to the rest of the world, uh, and you, you start to see Islamic influences uh, from uh, uh, Istanbul uh, and Cairo uh, and the rest of the world. This was the gateway for all of that spice uh, wealth to enter Europe. Uh, spices were very important and they're very lightweight. Also, before uh, there was European presence in Asia, there was Chinese presence, and uh, the Muslim Chinese navigator, Zheng He, I think is how we say that. No one will correct me. Um, he uh, went out and explored the Indian Ocean and all of the trading civilizations of the Indian Ocean, including uh, on the uh, east coast of Africa. So it was a very dynamic trade. And then we start to overlap. Uh, there, it was a very close near miss between the Chinese exploration of the Indian Ocean. You see it going up until 1431. And the first Portuguese explorations of the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Portuguese uh, 
Uh, you may not have heard of them. They're in this tiny, tiny little backward uh, uh, place in Europe that was dominated by the Muslims for centuries uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. And finally, after centuries of struggle uh, and Henry the Navigator, the ruler, uh, accumulating a lot of knowledge from the Chinese and the, uh, uh, from Islam, from the great libraries, uh, he actually managed to combine all of these innovations and make it around, uh, send Portuguese sailors around the Cape of Good Hope of Africa and across the Indian Ocean. And the myth of this moment is, uh, is the cry for gods and spice, for God and spice. So it was driven by Christian missionary zeal because the end times were coming very soon, and they had to convert as many souls as possible. And while they're at it, finally, after centuries of sending spies and war parties and trying to figure out where those spices are coming from, to cut out the middleman, all the Muslim traders bringing spices through the networks, uh, their goal was to find the source of the spices because if you bought it for $1 here, you could sell it for $500 there. So there's a lot of profit to be made. Uh, and so that's it was souls and spices. And on the soul part, uh, the Jesuit missionary, uh, Francis Xavier, uh, set off and established Goa. Goa was the center of the Portuguese uh, trading network. And uh, so he stationed himself in Goa, and from there uh, ventured throughout Asia, eventually reaching Japan and establishing a trade relationship between Japan and Portugal, and every point in between. Uh, and this figured heavily. Uh, it wasn't just Venice that was built on the uh, finances of the spice trade after the great earthquake and tsunami of 1531, uh, Lisbon was rebuilt on the wealth of the spice trade. And so this is really the first, uh, first chapter I want to establish here as a framework for everything that follows. There was globalism existed before Europeans knew about it. Uh, and it was a trade network dominated by Muslim traders and the Chinese in particular, uh, and then the Portuguese came on the scene. And um, when the Portuguese made it to Japan, the Japanese were sensitive about the influence of outsiders. So they established the island of Dejima in Nagasaki Harbor. And this was an enclave, first for the Portuguese and then for the Dutch, uh, as the Dutch took over from the Portuguese. The Japanese were very upset with the Portuguese Jesuit missionaries who converted uh, all their people to Christianity, and it was the basis of uh, rebel an armed rebellion in Japan that the Dutch helped settle. So based on that, and you may have seen the movie two years ago with um, Adam Driver that takes place in the context of these times of the missionaries. Um, a very good movie. Um, but the Dutch, who were much more uh, commercial-minded, they said, you know, you, we don't care about Christianity so much, but just trade with us. And so the Dutch took over the island of Tajima. Uh, and there it is uh, in Nagasaki Harbor. Um, and we're going to take a now a second reference point is first the Portuguese, then the Spanish, and then the English and the Dutch. These are two separate waves. The Portuguese and Spanish started to conquer the world in 1500 in terms of trade network, so much so that the Pope had to divide the planet in two. And they drew the line uh, down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and said, well, it went through Brazil. So that's why Brazil is Portuguese and uh, to the west of that line is all Spanish. And when they finally came to grips with the fact that the world was round several decades later, they had to keep that circle going around the other side. And that's why you have uh, some Portuguese and some Spanish colonies in Southeast Asia. Um, so the Dutch 
come 100 years later, the English and the Dutch come 100 years later, and they have this system of capitalism that turns out to be much more effective than uh, the royal monopolies of the Spanish and the Portuguese. And they use uh, multinational corporation joint stock certificates to finance uh, the trade between uh, Batavia, which is their new headquarters in, on the island of Java. And almost simultaneously, they build two cities on either end of the trade route. They build Batavia as the Dutch East India Company headquarters that's militarized and fortified and uh, filled with an international uh, workforce. Uh, they build that on the island of Java, and then that finances the construction of the city of Amsterdam. And they're both built on the ideal model of the Belgian uh, mathematician and engineer, um, Stevens. And it's two versions of the same urban model built almost simultaneously, but financed by the same 20,000 kilometer long trade route. <clears throat> And <clears throat> as part of the management of this whole system, they use paintings. And so also at about the same time, here's the scene in the market square of Amsterdam. It shows the key institutional, architectural, spatial relationships, and it shows the people who can, are each one of these people is identified by uh, anthropologists as specific characters that represent specific relationships. Uh, between different trading partners. So you have uh, traders from, uh, uh, at this time it's Istanbul, you have traders from Spain, uh, you have people from Germany, from England, and each of these characters is identified as a trading partner. And their characteristics are displayed in the costume, uh, which gets us into the issue of sumptuary codes and controls of who's who. The same, at the same time, almost the same formulaic painting is done of the marketplace in Batavia, where you have the fortifications, the gallows hanging people who are misbehaving, the governor, general, and the trading partners from all over the, the network of, um, of Dutch trade in Asia. Uh, and you have um, the priest from Dijima, uh, from the island of Dejima is this uh, Japanese Christian who was converted by the Portuguese Jesuits. And uh, you see him in the marketplace as well. So there's a, the, this network of Dutch trade also includes J Japan and China and the entire uh, South China Sea region. So we see this, um, it's really two sides. Uh, I would go so far, and I have gone so far as to argue, that it's one urban system. It's like the north side of town and the south side of town, but instead of being divided by the railroad tracks, it's divided by a 20,000 kilometer long trade route, but two sides of the same town. And here we see a similar evolution of the uh, sumptuary codes that control what people can wear, what they must wear, what they cannot wear according to their identity uh, that's codified in these paintings. But now in South Africa, a Dutch colony, Cape Town, uh, it evolves to the point where it's not about the costume, it's about the pass laws. And that's how you get the grand apartheid system from 1949 until uh, it collapsed. Um, another thing to note that comes up in this uh, study is uh, the flow of cultural attributes. So you see the Dutchman married to a Javanese woman uh, who is of very high status, you can tell because there's a servant carrying the parasol. And that comes directly from the practices of the royal court of Java. The king of Java um, always has to have a parasol over him to signify that he's the king. Well, the Dutch resident needs to be respected too, so the Dutch resident has to have the royal parasol as well. And so it became a symbol that was part of the status system that had to be controlled by sumptuary codes so that people didn't act above their station. Similarly, the king of Java can't be one-upped uh, by the Dutch resident. And so uh, he adopts the costume of the European colonizer. <coughs> 
uh, including the medals and the sash uh, and the military hat. And so there is this exchange of cultural attributes that happens uh, in terms of language, behavior, the use of chairs, the wearing of shoes, the costume, and the architecture. Uh, here's more of that, uh, the 10th king, uh, Paco Buono the 10th, uh, and the Dutch resident um, at two different moments. Uh, and uh, it happens in, um, this is the king of Thailand, uh, Cholonongkor, Siam at the time. Uh, he is visiting the palace in Java along with the Dutch resident and the king of Java. Uh, and it goes on till the present. This is from the 90s um, where the, the royal palace is still, this is the official costume. And this is a hybrid costume. Um, there was an evening affair where the, the prince uh, from a local palace was going to an event and the king was going to be there, which meant he had to wear a sarong and a sword and this hat. Uh, but also the Dutch resident was going to be there, which means he has to wear um, a proper European uh, tuxedo with the tails coat. Um, but every time he put the sword in with the tuxedo tails coat, the tails stuck up in an awkward manner. It was lumpy. And so he made the fashion statement of the season when he asked his tailor to snip off the tails. And fashion history was made. The traditional Javanese costume was established. And there it is. It's a hybrid uh, formation. And so, um, so the point uh, of uh, one of the points uh, is also that the domination that the Javanese experienced at the hands of the Dutch was happening all over Asia at the time. And it inspired the Japanese, who were already sensitive to things, to uh, declare that they were closing their borders. They had already closed their, uh, uh, said, we're not going to trade with uh, China anymore. So they, there was no direct trade between China and Japan. Uh, and that's one way that the Portuguese and then later the Dutch became filthy rich, is because they weren't just bringing wealth back to Europe uh, and selling European goods in Japan. They actually made more money uh, burying goods back and forth between China and Japan, taking advantage that they wouldn't trade directly. And so they made a fortune with that. But after the trouble with the Christian missionaries uh, and then seeing what was happening to other nations around Asia, they made a law and they said, anyone who has a ship that doesn't have a big hole in the side will be put to death you have to have a big hole in the side of your ship. If you have a high gunnel, um, that means uh, you can take a boat in the ocean waves without sinking. Uh, and, and that's not allowed. No Japanese person is allowed to leave the calm waters of the harbor. Uh, and if you take a ship uh, out of the calm of the harbor, your ship will be confiscated, burned, you will be put to death, your crew will be put to death. So starting um, in the mid-17th century, uh, the Japanese uh, enforced a very strict isolation policy, sakoku. Sakoku is probably how you pronounce it. Uh, and during the next two centuries, they thrived. And I think you've already looked at Japanese stuff, bit, yeah. Issei Shrine. Uh, Katsura Palace, Katsura Imperial Villa, um, one of my favorite topics in Japanese architecture um, that is worth looking at um, very briefly. It's a summer palace that was designed uh, in the 17th century during this period of isolation. And it's a landscape architecture uh, reference point for all modern archi uh, landscape architecture. And the buildings and the relationship between the buildings and the landscape have become a reference point for uh, uh, architecture and landscape uh, of modernism. Frank Lloyd Wright, Bruno Taut, and all of the Japanese uh, modernist architects um, 
It's an, an attitude towards materiality being very expressive of the material reality and its tectonic characteristics to be true and honest with material uh, attributes to the point where whenever possible the original natural state of the elements, the architectural elements, uh, or in selected moments of truth, they retain the natural uh, appearance of these materials. Uh, there is a use of screens that are structurally independent of the columnar structure. So it's like a domino house of, the, uh, of Corbusier. Uh, it was not uh, a unique invention of the European modernists. Japan had been doing it for centuries prior to that. All of the screens are movable. They're there to frame the views within and from in interior to exterior. And so this uh, Katsura Villa is uh, a remarkable demonstration of the power of carefully framed views that synchronize the landscape and the architecture. And it, it became noticed, um, it was first, it, there was a whole history of landscape painting that incorporated um, in axonometric, it was very much an axonometric painting tradition uh, in Japan. And as it became noticed by Bruno Taut, here's Bruno Taut's uh, book. We might have studied Bruno Taut last summer, I can't remember. Uh, but the way it gets documented by Arato Isosaki, who's the f a famous Japanese modernist architect, he um, builds on Bruno Taut's uh, interest in Katsura Villa and publishes this uh, remarkable book where it's treated like uh, a site of modern architecture drawn in axonometric and studied very carefully. So it's a really interesting uh, reference point to what happens with Japanese culture when it is isolated and allowed to flourish without any influence from outside. Uh, it actually becomes, in many ways, a parallel to modern architectural development. Where are we at now? We're at coming up on 20 minutes. Awesome. I might be able to do it. <laughs> so um, right on cue, as if to reinforce to Japan why they might like to isolate themselves from the rest of the world, uh, we have um, the growing trade between China and the European powers. The Chinese... Uh, established Canton, now it's called Guangzhou. Uh, they established uh, foreign concessions, which means these plots of land in the harbor of Canton are considered foreign territory in China, in a Chinese city. And so there are many paintings that depict the flags of the different nations flying over the warehouse structures uh, and so this is the architecture and infrastructure of global trade in Canton, China. Um, but it, there was a problem with this. Um, it had to do with, uh, if you wanted to buy something in Canton, you needed to pay with silver because that was the currency. Uh, you, well, you needed to pay with the currency of Canton. Uh, and. Uh, and so they had trouble. The British would, would try really hard. They would take their manufactured goods and they would bring it to Canton and they'd say, you want to buy this? And the Chinese uh, would say, no, thank you. We don't need that. Uh, we don't need this. We don't need that. We don't need the other thing. And the British would say, listen, we can't buy your tea. We're trying to explain to you, tea is very popular in England. You know, tea time, high tea. You've heard of that? You think of it as being an English thing. Well, it has become an English thing. Fortunately, no one was screaming cultural appropriation at that time. And so tea came from China to the British Isles and took, took the place by storm and became a very popular pastime. But the British had trouble paying for it because they didn't have the hard currency to exchange for the tea. So they did what any reasonable uh, capitalist power would do. They grew opium in India, sold it to the Chinese, got them addicted to it. You know, here's a few hits for free. You can have some for free. The first, the first hit is free. 
Um, but now you got to pay. So the British came in, they got their Chinese population addicted to opium, um, used that fact to reinforce their racial uh, uh, stereotypes of the Chinese being an inferior race, and then took all that cash that they got from selling opium and bought their tea. <laughs> Problem solved. Everybody's happy. And here's the opium uh, in India being grown. For some reason, Indians, or we're not going to waste our opium on Indians. They don't have anything we want. Uh, we're going to take that opium and sell it to the Chinese. By the way, the U.S. did a similar thing in the Iran in the 90s, so uh, we're not ones to point fingers. Um, so, um, so the Chinese say, hold on. This is a threat to our sovereignty. Um, this is against the law in China, and you are obligated to follow the laws of China. And the British said, um, try to stop us. And so uh, the Chinese Navy um, confiscated the cargoes of two ships, and that was a pretext for all-out war, another tactic that we've used very effectively um, more recently in the US. Um, and they uh, fought a very short war with China called the Opium Wars. And this was to uh, defend the right of capitalist um, merchants to sell opium in China, so free trade. Uh, and so China was humiliated by what happened, which is probably the single most important takeaway of this lecture is the humiliation of China, the total and utter humiliation of China uh, in 1840. Uh, and so uh, with the defeat of the Chinese forces, the European powers uh, said, you know what, Canton is good, but we'd like a few more ports. We'd like a few more foreign concessions. And so that was the par part of the Treaty of Nanjing of 1842. They divided up the shoreline of the Huangpo River in a place called Shanghai. You've probably heard of it. And so this was the beginning of the carving up of China by the European powers. They literally identified a French concession uh, and then other nationalities would have their sections. Um, and so this is the shore of the Huangpo River. This is basically where the boats come and go. Um, it's spelled Quay, but how do you how do you pronounce it? We did this in concentration studies. It's pronounced Qi. So this is the, the the point of exchange in Shanghai, along what is now the Bund. Which of our favorite professors redesigned the Bund recently? <coughs> Yes, points. <laughs> so the Bund becomes another international city in China. And it develops, and um, the warehouses along the quay uh, are converted to international headquarters. And uh, architects, especially architects and construction firms from the United States, uh, come to Shanghai to build out the Bund. And so you have this display of US architecture of the 1920s especially uh, that populate the Bund and are still there today. And it becomes comparable to the skyline of Manhattan around uh, a similar point of the early 20th century. And those buildings are still there today. Um, and so this is, the, the key takeaway of this is China's humiliation. Any questions? I think we're doing okay time-wise. We're doing great. Yeah. We're not even at 30 minutes yet. <sighs> so questions? So what is so important about the humiliation of China? What is so important about 
the isolation of Japan, what is so important about the Dutch domination of uh, the islands, the Southeast Asian archipelago now known as Indonesia? <clears throat> and what's so important about remembering the reference point that prior to around 1500, Europe was a primitive backwater while Asia and arguably the Americas were thriving for centuries up to this moment in 1500. And what will the, since we write architectural history retrospectively, uh, in a hundred years or more, looking back on this history, when uh, China is likely to be the dominant, China and India, because uh, of the size of their economies, are likely to be the dominant forces in the world. What will history, what histories will be written 100, 200 years from now? Uh, and when the dolphin archaeologists uh, excavate uh, these ruins thousands of years from now, and they speculate that there really were semi-intelligent life forms on land with two legs and hands, let's call them humans. The, the theories seem to be true. The evidence points to an advanced race of earthlings um, that lived on land. Um, th what will they say about this history? Um, and so we're accessing these larger perspectives here to speculate on how we should be looking at this history. So the 200, uh, the two centuries or so of Japanese isolation comes to an abrupt halt in 1853 when a, a U.S. Uh, naval ship uh, steams into Yokohama Bay. And um, this is a depiction of that moment. Or it's a, it's a compression of time because you see European architecture in Yokohama and you see uh, at the same time as Commodore Perry's ship is, is there in the harbor. So this is a compression of several decades. But basically, at, in 1853, the U.S. Uh, heavily armed U.S. ship steams into Yokohama Harbor and says, greetings from the U.S. president. Uh, we hereby declare Japan open for business. Uh, do you see our guns? So Japan is open for business. Uh, the, um, the emperor is the traditional emperor who was guarding, safeguarding the well-being of the Japanese people are, is discredited. And it triggers the Meiji Restoration. You may have seen Shogun uh, or um, other movies that depict uh, the events around this moment in history. Um, but the Japanese uh, basically uh, do a 180 degree turn. If, they're, if they can't be left alone, if they have no choice but to engage with the West, they are bound and determined to live up to their traditions of dominating. They are going to send out a mission across the seas to the US and Europe and figure out how these primitive Europeans are able to dominate. What is the machinery and the mechanism of their domination? How can we do that? So they come back from the, the Ikagawa embassy journey uh, two years, and they bring back uh, industrial technology uh, and architecture. And they go shopping for an appropriately imperial, Japanese imperial style. And uh, for those of you who were in the history class last summer, this part of the lecture will be familiar. We covered this topic. So this is a, a repeat, a review of that topic. Um, and I may ask you questions. So get ready. Um, so during the Beaux-Arts struggle in Europe, there was uh, a debate between uh, the classicists saying 
the architecture of Greece and Rome, that's the proper style for us to build European cities in uh, against Ruskin uh, and company. The Gothic style, no, the Gothic style is more authentic and we need to build according to the Gothic style. And so it was uh, red state, blue state, uh, peanut butter and chocolate kind of debate. And the aesthetic movement said, listen, just calm down, everybody. Don't stop being so ideological. Let's take the best of both worlds. Let's make things that are beautiful. And this was called the aesthetic movement. And so the aesthetic movement architecture uh, came to rise. And the Japanese saw this. And they said, we'll take one of these. Uh, and this is where last summer I would say, um, if you're the Japanese uh, emperor and you want to, uh, to mobilize your nation, your modern nation, if you want to catapult Japan from an isolated uh, culture, insular culture, into a global imperial power, who are you going to call? Who do you call? Who are you going to call if you need to? Ghostbusters. No, not Ghostbusters. Architects. architects, right. So you call the architects, and the architects say, yeah, we can give you an imperial style. Um, here we go. How about this? And they say, I'll take, I'll take a dozen. No, I'll take a hundred of these. And so the architects. Uh, um, some architects from Europe end up in Japan establishing schools of uh, Japanese architecture where this becomes, it is transferred from this aesthetic movement, it's all about art for the sake of art, it becomes a political, it becomes weaponized, it becomes uh, the instrumentation of imperial Japan. So they start small with Tokyo train station, um, we saw this building uh, in the summer lecture. It's one of my favorite buildings, the Yokohama Port Opening Building in Yokohama. It was built 50 years on the 50th anniversary of the opening of the port of Yokohama. So Perry comes from the US, um, forcibly uh, opens Japan to trade. And then 50 years later, this English architecture is deployed to celebrate that opening up of Japan to the world. Uh, when I turned the course over to Christina last summer, I then went here and took some photos for you all uh, because I went to a conference. Um, and here's the celebration of the US gunship. Uh, see the American flag celebrated in the stained glass window. So here's Japan celebrating the forced opening of Japan to the world. They've gone from being oppressed to victorious. They flipped it. They said, we are ready to take on the world. Um, and they celebrate it. And they embrace this architecture. They rebuild Tokyo. And then um, they, they take off. And they conquer Korea. They conquer parts of the Soviet Union. They conquer parts of China, Manchuria. Uh, they conquer French Indochina. And they conquer all of, eventually they conquer this entire area. Uh, by 1942, they've conquered, uh, they've driven out the British in uh, Malaysia and Burma. They've driven out the French in what we now call Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. They've conquered large parts of China. They've conquered the Philippines and they've driven out the British of uh, the Malaysian Peninsula and Singapore, and they've driven the Dutch out of the uh, what we now call Indonesia, all of the islands of Southeast Asia. Um, and so it's their industrialization is successful. They leverage their industrialization into war machinery, and off we go, World War II. Uh, and this is the building we looked at. This is the aesthetic movement landing uh, in colonial Taiwan. By 1912, uh, the Japanese have taken over Taiwan, and they build their colonial outpost in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, using the aesthetic style, there's a competition. The competition-winning entry is the one on top. 
but then they say, hold on, that's not imperial, it's not forceful enough, and so they, they beef it up. They pump steroids into the aesthetic movement uh, architecture and pump up the, the corners to make it more fortress-like and more imperial looking. And there it is. Um, it's a, an exemplification of power uh, in case anyone doubts the power of the Japanese. They located at the end of the axis. Um, so it's an urban form uh, thing as well. And um, it's a very straightforward Beaux-Arts plan. And when uh, the Japanese uh, are defeated in 1945 with the uh, dropping of the atomic bombs on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, um, the Chinese take over again. And one of two things can happen. They can uh, either say, this is uh, an exemplification of our oppression, and they tear it down, which is what eventually happens in Seoul, Korea, uh, where the aesthetic movement, the Japanese aesthetic movement, imperial architecture, is too, too much of a reminder of Japanese domination, and so they get rid of it. But here in China and later in Taiwan, it's embraced as the, the icon of the government. They put it on their money, uh, and they say, this is China now. And so this is uh, a really clear demonstration of the fact that architecture means what it means because it does what it does. And what it does is open to negotiation. So. Uh, that's how we get the modern architecture, the steel and glass architecture of socialist housing, uh, power to the people, redistribution of wealth of Soviet uh, uh, systems, is we can use that as a symbol of corporate America. And so it becomes the symbol first of redistribution of wealth, and then it becomes the symbol of uh, the triumph of capitalism. Similarly, architecture is available to be um, reappropriated re and retooled uh, so that it does um, what we need it to do. And you don't even have to call in the architects for that transformation. You just put it on your money and you proudly proclaim, this is Chinese, and then later you say, this is um, Taiwan. And uh, have you seen Man in the High Castle? So Man in the High Castle, uh, at the end of uh, the, in the last, they're facing a similar thing. How, what should we do with all of these symbols of US power? Do we, do we convert them and win them over? Or do we take them down? And so we see the, the destruction. Oh, I don't want to give it away. Sorry. Never mind. But it's a beautiful, powerful, horrifying thing. Three more. So that's 40 minutes. OK, that was a, I took a long time. I really indulged that one. Um, so here we are, back to Java. Uh, before the Japanese takeover, the Dutch are feeling bad about um, Dutch public opinion back home in the Netherlands has turned against the colonial project uh, because of a novel. Uh, Max Havelaar is a very, it's a viral novel about the abuses of power of Dutch colonial, uh, colonialism in the plantation system. And so the Dutch people say, okay, we want to hold on to our southern Netherlands, now known as Indonesia, uh, and I've met people who, when they were growing up, there was a map in their classroom in, in Holland that had the Netherlands. It was a map of the Netherlands. And there was this teeny tiny little European colored shape, and then this massive chain of islands. And that was the Netherlands. And the massive chain of islands was in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so there was a very strong sense of, this is the Netherlands. Uh, this is Holland. Uh, and so there was a debate. Um, so the queen, the queen of uh, the Netherlands said in 1901, she said, 
we're done being oppressive, we're going to have an ethical policy. Now we're going to redevelop the colonies for the benefit of the colonial subjects, regardless of race. Um, and there are over 400 distinct nationalities uh, in the islands. So they weren't just talking about the Javanese and the Balinese, they were talking about the 73 races, uh, ethnicities on Sumatra, and the several hundred ethnicities, distinct ethnicities and language groups, and na arguably nations um, of Papua, and what we now call Papua New Guinea. And so these two architects um, are are, came together in this hall for a debate. And the debate was, uh, if we're going to uh, reinforce and justify the continuation of Dutch colonial rule in the region, we need an architecture of the ethical policy. What is the appropriate architecture of the ethical policy? Because everyone knew that if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to justify the continuing domination of the place, you need an appropriate architecture. Everyone knew that. You got to call the architects. And so the debate within the uh, community of architects here in Bandung, Java, was what's the appropriate architecture for a good colonial, a, an ethical colonial architecture. And so Schumacher, on one side of the stage in 1923, Schumacher says, well, let's face it, the only good architecture of the islands are the ancient stone monuments. And this is Borobudur and Prambanan, the Hindu and Buddhist, two of the largest Hindu and Buddhist monuments in the world, the largest Buddhist monument in the world. And he said, that's the only appropriately civilized architecture of the islands, and that's what we need. We need a great civilization architecture to deploy and justify our colonial presence. And he also pointed at uh, the Imperial Hotel uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan. So here we are, Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, uh, doing a similar thing. Let's put a modern building and then decorate it with great civilization. Uh, motifs. And so uh, Schumacher uh, goes, goes on six years later and does this hotel that's a modern building uh, with a great uh, civilization motif, but the motif he ends up selecting has nothing to do with Buddhist Borobudur, nothing to do with Hindu Prambanan. He chooses a Mayan motif. Doesn't matter, we're shopping for great civilizations who you're going to call, call the architect. And the architect says, I have something, I have a special this week on Buddhist Borobudur, or uh, here in the discount bin, I can give you Hindu Prambanan. And the client says, no, 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 I don't want any of that. What else you got? And he said, well, I have this Mayan stuff. I love it. Give me Mayan. Mayan. At the same time, his opponent on the other side of the stage is Henri McLean Pont. And so Pont is ethnically Dutch, but he's born in uh, the Dutch colonies of the East Indies, and he marries a Javanese woman. And he speaks Javanese, and he is an aficionado of Javanese culture. He loves the great arts, uh, the shadow puppet, the music, the gamelan music. Do you know any of these things, gamelan? I should have a video with all that stuff. Um, and so, he studies the indigenous cultures of the islands, of which there are hundreds to choose from. And he says, I don't want to favor the Javanese. They're dominant enough. Um, I need to hybridize multiple different styles of architecture to create the Institute of Technology in Bandung. So MIT, Wentworth, and then the hundreds of other copies of MIT all around the world. Here's the Dutch one in Java, the Bandung Institute of Technology. They, they need a, a clear symbol of the ethical policy colonial architecture. Who are you going to call? Architects. The architects. And so they call Pont, and this is what he does. Uh, and so he's standing up there, and he's saying um, these in, on the debate stage, he's saying, sure, Borobudur, I, I, I give you Borobudur as an important place, 
But don't just look at Borobudur itself. Look at the sculptural representations of indigenous architecture um, immortalized in the bas-relief sculptural uh, depictions of the life of the Buddha in the lower levels of Borobudur. And he notices the curves, and he notices the, this is a rice barn uh, raised up that was a, considered to be a holy shrine because it, uh, it is the essence of all life. Um, and so um, looking at these building typologies, and the thing I want you to notice here is how uh, it's not really a curve. It's not a true curve, but it's a built-up form. And so this is what he does in his Bandung Institute of Technology. He brings in the European heavy timber truss with wrought iron brackets. It's a very um, European technology that he deploys, and it's still there, so you can go photograph it. Um, but then to get this shape, he, uh, he creates a very flat ridge, and then he builds up to get that contour. And um, this is what he's doing uh, just before he gets on the stage. And basically, Pont loses the debate uh, with Schumacher. Um, and so Schumacher goes on to win all the commissions. Pont withdraws. He goes into colonial service. He goes throughout, throughout the archipelago uh, <coughs> telling the colonial architectural job uh, is to go from village to village, survey their architecture, and convince them to do two things. Stop living in longhouses. Longhouses, there's a lot of fornication in longhouses and a lot of incest. We need nuclear families, single family dwellings. So your job, Pont, is to convince them to move into single family dwellings. And second thing, stop building with natural materials. Don't use thatch, don't use bamboo, these things rot and decay and insects and disease. So it's all about morality and hygiene. And so, um, but in the process, he gets the tectonic uh, culture bug um, that Kenneth Frampton gets many decades later. And he starts to figure out well, the, the moment of truth in the debate was Schumacher says, um, everybody knows that when you make a yeah. beam, here's my prop. Okay. How strong is this piece of corrugated cardboard? Weak. Hmm? Weak. It's weak? Or is it very, very, very strong? It's a trick question. It depends. If you do it like this, it can support, um, you know, maybe a little, little buckle eventually. But it, it can support about 10, 20 pounds of force. 20 pounds of force. But if you go this way, it doesn't, it's weak. So you know that uh, those of you who are juniors, who's a junior? Just two of you? These are the seniors. OK. Um, well, all of you should remember the juniors had it on the quiz last week. But what's the moment of inertia? What determines the stiffness of this? Oh, OK. It's 112 the base times the height cubed. So that's the, that's the mathematics behind this phenomenon. The base is very narrow, eighth of an inch. It's not worth much. But the height is 30 inches. Right? So 30 inches cubed, huge moment of inertia, huge. Whereas this one, the base is 30 inches and the height is eighth of an inch, tiny moment of inertia. So not stiff at all. Very stiff, not stiff. Schumacher said, look at the rafter beams of the Javanese architecture. Every, they don't stand up like this. They lay flat like this. Obviously, they are unsophisticated uh, engineers and architects because they don't even understand how stiffness works. 
right? Uh, the wood structures decay and melt into the forest from which they came. Good riddance. But Pont said, let's look at the royal architecture of the palaces and the temples. And he said, the reason uh, they, he, this is when he leaves the debate in defeat because he had no response to this clear engineering demonstration that stiffness is greater when you stand the rafters up this way. Why would the Javanese sit their rafters in the weak direction unless they're just incompetent? So uh, Pont lost the debate. He goes off and Shane travels the islands, collects his research, figures out that actually they do that on purpose because every wooden structure is trying to behave like a tensile structure. And so he's particularly interested in this building here where the lower roof is hanging off the, the eave end like a, where this rafter is on a fulcrum point. So the weight of the lower roof takes out the bend. So it's this, this fulcrum makes the whole structure lift up towards the heavens. And this was a religiously uh, informed uh, tectonic strategy. You want your holy buildings to lift up towards heaven. How do you get a building to lift up towards heaven? The Javanese architects know how to do it. Uh, and this is a building, so I was really interested. I had collected these materials when I was living in Java, uh, but only looked at it later when I was back here doing my graduate degree. Um, so I was really interested when I saw this, um, because I spent a lot of time with my head stuck into that joint trying to figure it out. There I am trying to figure this out. And I had no idea that Pont had been looking at the same thing. I was there trying to study this building, and then I was there uh, trying to restore a lot of the buildings. Uh, I got a three-month grant uh, during a slope time in the architecture profession. And I stayed for four years, and I became the architect for the King of Java. And we restored the palace buildings. And this is both the carpenter, the head carpenter, but he's also a priest in the palace. And so um, this turns out to be a very deliberate detail of Javanese and Balinese architecture, where the rafters sit on this fulcrum point. And in that one building, the lower roof pulls on that and lifts the roof towards the heavens, takes the sag out. But it also uh, moves in earthquakes and wind loading. And it turns out um, that every piece of the building is uh, both has a name, and the name refers to the, both the structural function of the piece and its religious meaning. Uh, and all the architecture is based on the sacred dimensions of the king or the owner of the house. Uh, but in my case, uh, we were doing things according to the king. Um, and here's more hybridization. You see the tailcoat, the Ottoman fez, the b Dutch brass band, the Baroque architecture. Uh, it's all mixed together. Um, and so these cultures flow, and the cultures are also extremely conservative. So this could have been taken, um, uh, this is a scene that could have been seen uh, hundreds of years ago because they've been doing this for so long. This is an Islamic religious ceremony but it uses the Hindu symbols of the linga and yoni, uh, sexual organs of the sacred symbols of sexuality in Hinduism, but here deployed in the service of Islam. <coughs> A very unlikely thing in most Islamic societies. And the palace itself is uh, an instrument of maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. Uh, and there's the uh, opening of the Aga Khan um, Award for Architecture in 95. That were the, they were the funders of the restoration of the palace. Um, but Pont, once he figures this out, he uh, revisits some of the architectures where these forms are not built up from rigid elements, but a natural outcome of the materials uh, and how they're used. He tracks down all the 
Javanese timber framing practices, each with a sacred uh, name. And he tracks, traces it back to uh, original construction in bamboo uh, and thatch and natural materials. And the survey of all the different architectural traditions, uh, there's a lot of swoopiness going on. And so he spends the rest of his life um, until he dies in the Japanese internment camp in 1942, uh, exploring, instead of using uh, wood rafters, instead of using bamboo rafters, he's using steel cables so that when the wind blows, uh, it, the, the clay tiles make a, a sound, like the whole structure is dynamically moving um, with all these swoopy curves uh, because it's a tensile structure. And so he goes, uh, after the debate, he goes from building up his forms from rigid pieces to achieving the same forms with the natural uh, form taken on in the relationship between forces and materials. And so the form is, a, is an outgrowth, is a direct outgrowth of forces acting on materials. A very interesting uh, approach to form making. Let's go back to China. Um, World War II, communist revolution, close ties with the Soviet Union, lots of Soviet style construction. Mao dies. Uh, China is independent and communist and a great nation, but it's still been humiliated by the West. So what you're going to do? Who are you going to call? Architects. Architects. So they have a competition. They say, Shanghai, we know, we know that uh, New York, London, and Tokyo are global cities. We need one of those. We'll, architects will take one global center of trade. What you got? We want to build it in Shanghai on a site across the river from the Bund. There's the Bund. Remember the Bund? Mark Klopfer. So here's a bunch of rice fields. Um, it's available. We want to build a global city. What do you have for us? Uh, and, the, and so they have a competition. And the architects say, well, Manhattan? Would you like a Manhattan over there? Or perhaps you would like a Venice? What are you in the mood for? Uh, and they say, well, how about a Paris? Would you like a Paris? And this is literally what they're doing. This is, like the Japanese, uh, competitive emulation of your competitors. You emulate your competitors, and then you beat them at their own game, like the Japanese did, almost, in the end. So uh, all these famous architects, Richard Rogers, SOM, you name it, in the 90s, all the famous architecture firms enter, and the winner is the Chinese team. They win. Uh, and so the Chinese team, basically, when they win the commission, they take the ideas of the other entrants, and they deploy it in a hybrid solution, and we have Pudong. At one point, uh, one-fifth of the world's cranes were all here. Uh, currently, four or five of the tallest building, ten tallest buildings in the world are in Pudong, um, and they, and and there it is, the Bund and Pudong facing each other, and they did it. Shanghai is now a world center, um, and competitive emulation continues um, in the ghost cities of China. You've probably heard about these. This is a a, a, a copy of Thames of London. So they basically hire Chinese architects to replicate. They send them in a plane to London or not. They just say, look on the internet, figure out how to build a replica of an English <coughs> town. And that's what they do. And so they did nine of these, some in Dutch style, some in Italian style. Uh, they did the same thing in Indonesia. No one lives there, but it's a great place to have wedding photography. So that's the um, current use. Um, and if you talked about China uh, building cities and urbanizing and moving people into cities, well, they're doing it so fast that um, these farmers buy these condos, but they don't 
and they have big TVs and running water, but they don't have money, they don't have the income to pay the electric bill, so they can't run their washing machines, so they still do their laundry in the local rivers. Um, it's a very strange, uh, awkward, to say the least, situation. Um, but the whole point, remember China's humiliation? Well, uh, Japan was very successful in overcoming their humiliation for a time. Well, now it's China's turn. If, if you think that China is just trying to become wealthy and powerful the way we like, we like money, right? Capitalism, capitalism in the United States thrives because we like money. Who likes money? Yeah, we love money. But for us, we can't imagine people being motivated, motivated by anything but grades and money. Or maybe something else. But in China's case, it's not just about the money. Money is a vehicle to achieve uh, a res restoration of the dignity and power that they once, uh, they once commanded. Uh, this is uh, a connection to the first slide where you saw the Silk Roots, the Silk Road, um, that China was the dominant partner in that of Silk Route trade. What is this called? What is China doing right now? What's their big push? Is it the, the um, well, it was the one silk road, right? The, the transit that runs through everything? Yeah, they call it the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, something like that. One belt, one road, something like that. But it's, it's a direct reference to the Silk Road, the Silk Route. They're trying to restore the Silk Route domination of global trade. They are, uh, they are dominating Africa because Africa is the new major growth pole. Afri the fate of Africa will determine whether we hit peak human population at 9 billion around 2060 during your careers or 11 or 12 billion. What happens in Africa? Africa is the last place that's really growing. China and, and India have a few more decades of growth. Japan stopped growing a long time ago. Uh, Indonesia is still growing, but not nearly as fast as the others. But the real question mark about what is the final peak human population, it will be Africa. And the question of how many degrees Celsius will the global temperature rise that answer will be coming from China and India, not so much the United States, unless we, you, have an impact on the models of development um, that are uh, replicated uh, or pursued by China and India. So when the dolphin archaeologists uh, excavate the ruins at the bottom of the global ocean uh, to see what happened, uh, they're going to find this, the, uh, this evidence, uh, and uh, they'll be able to figure out what happened to those humans based on the architecture that gets produced out of this system. So I have another thing that's all about bamboo that um, is really pretty and optimistic. So maybe it would be good to look at these um, to feel happier, because there are alternatives. Bamboo, uh, basically what's happening in Bali and in places all over the world is a bamboo revolution. Uh, these designers, this designer in particular, uh, uh, they're designing beautiful, handmade, handcrafted, artistic creations this is a seven-story, million-dollar mansion uh, on the, uh, next to a river. Uh, it's just a gorgeous creation. There are no walls. There's no air conditioning. Uh, it's made out of grass. The bamboo is a grass. The grass grows. Uh, within three years, it's, it's large enough. Um, 
you can't use bamboo structurally unless it's three or four years old. So it grows very quickly uh, and can be used um, to make things like this. Uh, and uh, the question is, will these models catch on? Currently, uh, you can't get, uh, you can get wealthy expatriates to buy, uh, to commission these mansions of bamboo, but it's very difficult to get uh, locals uh, to be attracted to bamboo because the Dutch prohibition against bamboo structures has been so completely embraced by local populations. We had a student here a few years ago from Vietnam. He said uh, his father still had a bamboo structure on his property, and the local village head kept telling him, you got to get rid of that. It's, 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 it's doesn't look good for us. You know, you got to replace that with a proper building. So uh, one of the questions in, that hang in the balance is how quickly can we restore these building practices um, to where they used to be? These are Wentworth students. So that's it. We don't have time for this. <laughs> Although this one's good. One of the things we built last September was a retractable yurt. This is the campus of the Green School. You can see the big Green School building in the background. So for, um, for <coughs> disaster relief, et cetera, and you probably saw that on campus. OK. Thank you so much. That's it. Um, do you have time to take any questions? I do. Any? Just a few minutes. Um, yes. Do you guys have any questions or even comments or things that relate to other things we've seen in the class? I think for some of you, I mean, so for Cullen, for example, you probably learned some stuff that you didn't already know, even though Cullen's been doing Japan for his case studies. Um, well, I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, I was wondering, when you take your students to Indonesia, which buildings do you take them to visit that you think are important for them to see? Um, I take them to temples. Um, I take them to temples mm -hmm. so they can see uh, the relationship between the religion and the architecture. That uh, unlike, because we're so used to there being uh, the autonomy of architecture. We're so used to architecture being a thing and then as a completely separate element, the act, we fill it with activities and program. And the connection between the two are coincidental or, um, but here we see, um, we see that the architecture has this reflexive relationship with the uh, religious practices. The religion does not work the way it works except as a result of how the architecture works. So there is a symbiotic relationship the religion can only do what it does because the architecture does what it does. And the architecture, when the religion changes, the architecture changes. When the architecture changes, the religion changes. And it's com totally locked. And um, that's the architecture that I want Wentworth students to experience. And we, then we plant rice. Because there's a similar relationship to the landscape. The landscape works the way it does because the religion controls it. They tried to bring in green revolution technologies uh, and it caused widespread starvation. And they quickly said, oh my God, go back to your temple system of planting uh, rice and sharing water. Um, <clears throat> because it didn't work. The people starved. The agricultural driven by scientific methods uh, failed because it was disconnected from the water sharing practices of the religion. And they have these tunnels, these irrigation tunnels, uh, 
that are remarkable um, engineering feats that no one really understands how they did that uh, several hundred years ago. <clears throat> A lot of what you said resonated with what we've discussed in our class, which is this idea that you can never, even though these places aren't colonies anymore, you can't go back, you can't pretend that that never happened. Mm -hmm. So it's still today this ongoing negotiation of um, things that are more local versus things that are imported and, you know, traditional culture versus modernity or modernist culture. Right. Um, and I think what, you're, what you've showed us really resonates with some of the other examples we've looked at from Africa, from Latin America, things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's no, um, <coughs> there's no debate over cultural appropriation mm. like there is here. We can't pretend that things are separate and isolated. Culture flows. Yeah. Uh, you know, otherwise, we would resist uh, writing. Writing is Phoenician. You can't write, right? And the numerals, that's Arabic. You can't use Arabic numerals. That's for Arabs only. Right? Fortunately, we got over that pretty quickly. Any other commentary or questions you guys want to ask? I have a quick one. Uh, you said that, um, just I was kind of interested when you were talking about the bun and Mark Clawford. How involved was he in, in redesigning that? Well, this is typical for what you're likely to experience when you uh, get involved in similar projects. His firm was hired to redesign the landscaping of the Bund, uh, that whole waterfront area. Uh, and they redesigned it. And then, like in the Shanghai Pudong competition, they said, We'll implement it. You don't have to do uh, construction administration on this project. We'll take care of it. Uh, and then they proceeded to alter it uh, dramatically. So they like getting the core design. They like putting the prestigious name. Uh, this is a great firm from Boston in BBJ. Um, and uh, they love that part. But then they don't like to pay their bills, and they don't like to implement it as designed. So that's why you get a, a replica of Zaha Hadid's uh, Beijing opera done very poorly uh, somewhere else in China. I can't remember that story so much. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you so much. This was thank really you so much. a great conversation.